Hey folks, Todd Colburn here with your Aerospace Structure Series. This lecture is going to look at the use of canned functions for computing the slope and deflection of beams. You're going to want to have your Aerospace Strength Handbook handy and open your book to the beam formulas and page in the Appendix D. You can actually also use any other industry resource that has a set of canned functions. You just won't be able to match exactly what we're looking at, but you'll be able to get the basic approach and idea. <clears throat> Here's how it works. So first open your book to the table of beam functions. It's Appendix D in the Aerospace Strength Handbook, and these are some of the choices. Many undergraduate textbooks on structural mechanics or strength of materials will have maybe three to five choices. More uh, comprehensive books on structural analysis will often have more, and here's a bunch of them that are available from the Aerospace Strength Handbook. What you're going to do when you want to use a canned function is first you're going to look at your own structure. You're going to idealize it as a beam with constraints and external loads, and then you're going to come here and you're going to look among the cases that are available to find out if you have first the constraints that you have for your beam, and then secondarily the external loads. So the general classes of beams will include a, uh, a cantilever beam, like the first few choices we see here, uh, a pinned pinned beam, which you see some choices here. You see propped beams where you have a fixity on one end and a pin on the other end. And you have overhanging beams where you have pins or 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 constraints, uh, fully clamped uh, and pinned constraints along the beam. So here you see different choices. And the first thing we're looking at is the constraints. Do they perfectly match? Next, we're going to look at the external loading. For if we find, so if we find a cantilever beam that has a point external load, whether it's up or down on the end of the beam, that would be our case 1A. If we see the same beam, same constraints, but the force is located somewhere else, that's going to be case 1B. If you have a distributed load, that's going to be case 1C. If it's a moment, it's going to be 1D as long as the moment is on the end. If you have a overhanging beam with two simple supports, you've got case 3A and so on with various constraints. You're looking for first constraints, secondarily external loads. If you can find precisely the one that you have, then actually canned formulas are probably the easiest and more straightforward way of getting deflection and slope. Usually the max deflection is offered. Some references will give you the reactions as some of these do. Some of them will give you the moment function as a function of x. Some of them will only give you the max, uh, the max deflection or the max moment. So it depends. I've added a lot of stuff into my handbook to make it simple. But if you can find precisely the case, that will be the quickest and most efficient way. If it's not precisely there, often you can characterize the loading so that you can use a couple of these cases and superimpose those. When that happens, it might be easier, the easiest way. Keyword might be. And then sometimes you have to kind of manipulate these cases, you can still construct it, but it probably won't be the easiest way. We're going to look at some cases. We're going to see what is the easiest way that we think, and then start looking for when we might go back to a more direct approach of using singularity functions. So let's take a look at how that works. So let's take a look at this case. If we look at this particular case, we look, we've got a pinned, pinned beam with a loading located somewhere along the beam. We find out that case 2A is precisely that. That's what it looks like. All we need to do, these are the, uh, this is the, the deflection equation. Now remember, when we have a point load, we're going to have, if we use continuous calculus, we're going to have another uh, one function for every little span of the beam where something changes. In this case, we've got uh, moving from left to right, we have that, ex that reaction at A. So that's going to define one function for the span from A to B. 
that point load at point B means you're going to have a new function to represent the next piece, both for moment and for deflection. Hence, we have two different functions here for the deflection. We use the first relation if we're between A and B. We use the second relation if we're between B and C. Remember, it's critically use the right relation. Now, this is actually going to be maybe probably easiest if we have this kind of beam to just use the canned equation rather than doing using continuous calculus or using singularity functions. However, some of us look at this with, oh, now I've got to deal with two equations for this beam. If I do much deflection analysis, I've got to select the right one and plug in values. It might be easiest just to write the singularity function, which would give us a single function for the deflection from end to end. However, if we're just looking for the max deflection or something like that, it's probably quicker just to grab this and plug and shut. So once we find this case, we would insert our external load, being careful to identify whether we're positive or negative relative to the direction that's shown in the case, what our A and B parameters are, and so on. If we have this particular case, we look at our beam and we find that that is not in our handbook, at least not in the aerospace strength handbook, Therefore, writing the singularity function is probably the easiest way. This one here, we can see that this exists. That's case 2e. So we just plug in. We have two functions once again. We can just plug in values and use that. If we have this case, we find this is just case 2e as well. Except now, instead of placing that moment at 5 inches, we now place it at 20 inches and our B dimension now is zero, but the same case still applies. So some folks might not recognize that. With a little bit of experience, you'll start noticing that some of these parameters can be manipulated along the beam and some can't. If we see this case here, we say, well, there's no direct case, but we do have two cases that apply to pieces. We can use case 2A with these inputs and use case to E with these inputs, and then you just superimpose those two results to get the total deflection. Here's another example. This example is act actually out of uh, Beer and Johnson, this particular beam picture. And if we wanted this, we could do the same thing. We see once again, we're just case two, uh, 1A, which we show here. We This is our uh, deflection equation. That's the max deflection. That is the slope or the max slope and so on. We can actually write our result like this and box our answers. Now you'll notice there's no theta here. So in this particular case, if we want the slope of the beam, all we need to go do is go back to our y of x function, integrate it once, excuse me, differentiate it once, and that will give us the relation for the slope. And we can do it this way. That's that differentiation and then some simplification occurring. If we have another case, this picture is also from Beer and Johnson's text. If we have a cantilever beam with an end load, once again, we see that's just case 1D. It looks like this in our handbook. That is the deflection equation. And we can go through and now just uh, grab the other max, the theta, whatever is given. And anytime they're not given, we can differentiate for it. If we have this beam here, You'll notice this also is covered, but it's not directly covered in the handbook. It's just this case reversed. It looks like this in the handbook, and it looks like uh, the other in our, our actual problem. Now, you'll notice the case in our handbook is defining x. It's going to give us all the values, but it's defining x moving from left to right, from A to B. Our other beam actually is identical, but only... If it's reversed, therefore, for this these equations to be working, we have to define x from right to left rather than left to right. Unfortunately, if you're looking for precise answers, that can screw people up because the sign tweaks. The easiest way to do this is probably to use that x defined from right to left now, and then define a new variable, and, and, and this is what that is for as a function of x, then what we do is we define a new variable. So we want to define a new variable moving from left to right. We'll call it x prime. We can then write x as a function of x prime. x is just l minus x prime. 
We can insert that into the original equations, and then we have an equation for our reversed beam. This is probably the easiest way to solve it. Now, the easiest way to get the theta here is probably going to go back. Some uh, Many of us will get screwed up if we try to integrate that or differentiate that with that x prime. So what you can do is go back to the y of x, differentiate that to get the theta, and then insert your, your substitution of x equals l minus x prime to get the equation for that theta. Got that? And it would look like this. See how that works? Now, if you get proficient at this, you can still do this quicker than you can use even singularity functions. But if you start getting wrapped around the axle doing any of these uh, manipulations, all you need to do is go back to what we learned about singularity functions. This particular beam only needs a single singularity function, which it's really into easy to integrate are four times to get our, our deflection from our loading function, and, uh, and the substitutions for our constants of integration are quite simple, too, for this particular beam. So that may be easiest to just deal with that familiar territory. Here's another example. Once again, we look at this, we say, well, this doesn't precisely belong in our hand. It's not in our handbook, but if we reverse case, 1c, we can do that. Once again, we're going to use a substitution of variables in order to solve that. Got that? That's how we do those kind of beams. How about this beam here? If we look at this, we say, all right, it looks like here, while this particular case doesn't exist, we do have cantilever beams, and we have cantilever beams with both with a force or with a moment. So we take these two cases, we would get our loading for each, and then you'll notice here we've taken the y of the one plus the y of the other. We superimpose those, and we're just proceeding as normal. Okay? Here's another case. If we look in our handbook, we don't see this, but we do see a beam, a cantilever beam, with a single point load, and that, that formula does allow that point load to be at different places, hence we can use that three times. We'd use this equation. Is This is our, our beam, and this is the two equations. Now, the tricky part here is when we look at this, we see, all right, for this particular beam with a single point load, we have two functions. So we have a function from before the load, A to B, and a function for after the load, B to C. However, each point load that we have has a pair of these functions. So if we write our equation for the whole beam, we're going to have to be careful. For example, first we're going to write this beam when A is equal to A, and we're going to do that for our PB is our force, P. And we're going to have two functions, one for, the left, for A to B and one for B to D. Then we write that same equation for PC, and now our A dimension that we plug into these formulas is A plus B. So now that first function will be valid all the way from A to C, and the second function will be valid from C to D, where A, though, in both of these relations is going to be A plus B. The third time we use it uh, will be for PD, and in that case, we're going to use that Y of A to B for the entire beam. Our force value will be PD, and our A value will be A plus B plus C. So this is how it looks. You'll notice here we have the first term. This is for A to B. All three of these loads introduce a term. Uh, however, for the first load, PB, our A value is just A. For PC, our A value is A plus B, and for PD, our A value is A plus B plus C. All of these three functions, this is in the before the force hits uh, little piece. Now, for the next piece, B to C, we're going to have to switch. Our first relation for PB is going to take the second term, the after the loading term. You'll notice we're seeing the using the B to C portion of our original function for that one, but
but the other two loads are still be uh, the second load, the second and third load are both before, so they're both using the A to B part of that Y equation. Now from C to D, two of our loads, both PB and PC, use the second function, and our PD still uses the first function. Now this is actually quite simple, and it's something that every engineer should be able to do. However, this is probably more straightforward to just write the singularity function because we have a force value at the left end. We have a moment value at the left end. We have three, uh, two other forces we need to write the singularity function term for. And because of the fixity at the left end, that imposes both a deflection and a moment constraint. Both of our constants of integration are going to end up being zero, which is going to make that quite simple. If we have this little beam here, we look at our <coughs> handbook and we find out that this is not in there. Uh, and so we can just use uh, singularity functions, no problem. If we look at this one here, we also see, well, actually, this doesn't look like it's in our handbook. Hence, singularity functions will be the easiest way. So once again, the reason, now it seems like the can functions are quite limited, and that's actually true, but there are many beams which can be approximated with one of those simple cases that are in the handbook. And whenever they do occur exactly like we see them, can functions will be easiest. Also, many industry professionals tend to be a little weak at singularity functions, and they may find manipulating different cases for the can functions may be easier for them than using singularity functions. However, any of you that have reviewed my lecture on singularity functions should already be aware that singularity functions are way easier than people think. And they are the simplest way for many loadings and any kind of tangled loading that will be the easiest way to dispatch it. Hope this helps. If you like the video, be sure to write a comment or if you have a question, feel free to write it. I'll do my best to respond. If you like the content, stay tuned for more of the same. Enjoy.